Welcome everyone. My name is Aaron Reeder. My pronouns are he and him. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Access at the Seattle Theater Group. To aid in making this event accessible, I will describe that I am a black man with a bald head wearing a gray sweater and a burgundy shirt. I would like to start today by recognizing that Seattle Theater Group acknowledges that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the ancestral land of the Duwamish, Susquamish, and Muckleshoot tribes, and that we occupy this land. This acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities, but serves as a first step in honoring the land that we occupy. Today's event is the STG presents the People's Theater Talks. This conversation is the third in a series focused on race and social justice within today's performing arts. These community gatherings will virtually bring in experts in the areas of theater, music, dance, visual arts, and more to explore ways in which historically excluded communities are being represented, misrepresented, absent, or changing on stages and in art mediums. Particular shows may be considered, but are not the sole focus of these timely events. Today's topic is classical music and black artists. Our guests include Will Baptiste and Kev Marcus. I'd like to make a note that Kev Marcus is out ill and will not be joining us today. However, Will is a member of the Black Violin Group. Will is classically trained on the violin and viola and collaborates with fellow artist Kev Marcus on merging string arrangements with modern beats and vocals. Their style is building bridges in communities across the country and has been noted as keeping classical music alive for the next generation. Take the Stairs, their most recent release was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Instrumental Album and they continue to headline sold out shows across the country. Damari McGill is the co-founder of Art of Elon, the Myraid Trio, and the McGill McHale Trio. Damari coaches and presents master classes internationally. He is a faculty of the Aspen Music Festival and School and an associate professor of flute at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. Damari previously served as principal flute with the Dallas and San Diego symphonies, the Florida Orchestra, and the Santa Fe Opera Orchestra, as well as acting principal flute with the Metropolitan Opera and Pittsburgh Symphony, and is now with the Seattle Symphony. And our moderator is Dr. Carlene Brown. Dr. Brown is a musician, music educator, board certified music therapist, and arts manager. Her early training began in Boston, Massachusetts, where she studied music education and music therapy, taught in the Boston public school system, and began a lifelong career of working with youth and the arts, starting at Tanglewood for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Brown earned a doctorate in systematic musicology with a focus on the psychology of music from the University of Washington. She is currently a professor of music at Seattle Pacific University and the director of the SPU Music Therapy Program. And we are honored to have her moderating the conversation with us today. Please welcome Dr. Brown, Will, and Damari. It is a pleasure to have each of you with us today. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brown. Thank you, Erin. I appreciate that introduction of all three of us. And this is the first time really in the last few minutes we've been meeting virtually. So it's nice to meet you, Will. It's nice to meet you, Damari. And I appreciate your time from your on this topic. We are all classically trained African-Americans. Before I continue, I would just like to um, um, begin by saying that I am an African-American um, female with uh, long curly hair, wearing a white and um, a white shirt with black trim. For those um, that we want to acknowledge, that are a part of this community, um, the discussion that I'd like to have with you, and I'm hoping that it is really just a relaxed conversation, is 
how we ended up being in this area of classical music, especially as African Americans. And where is your work taking you now? What are the challenges? What, uh, who and what motivates you? Who supports your work? What are the what are the dimensions of what it is that because you are doing very different kinds of work, but then not so different in the field of classical music. And then also, what do you see as um, what it might be that we could bridge the gap between African Americans and classical music? Or is that even necessary to even have a conversation? Does it matter with you? I've been reading um, uh, during this month of Black History Month, there's been quite a bit out in the, and to the blogs. And one is that it's important that we do tell our stories. Um, that if for no other reason to break stereotypes, to name the challenges that exist for us, maybe unique, maybe not, and what allows us to thrive. So with that, I would like to open up this dialogue with you and ask you to reflect upon um, and honor at least one individual who helped start you on this career path of being a trained classical musician. And not only how you got started, but especially in your youth, because this is the hard part, what kept you motivated? Were you teased? Were you accepted? Were you supported? How did you continue continue to have a career in classical music? So I will start with Damari. Could you give a little bit of perspective of your background and how you got started? Sure, it's great to be here with, with you all. Um, just to provide a, a brief description of myself, I'm an African-American male, uh, very short hair, I'm currently wearing a navy blue thin sweater and navy blue glasses. So I started playing the flute um, when I was seven, but um, and it's, I mean, it's a story of of the of what can what can happen is simply when a girlfriend gives a boyfriend a gift. Before I was born, my parents, when they were dating, would have jam sessions, and my mother would sing, and my uncle would play, you know, drums, bongos, and my father would play a wooden African flute. And before they were married, my mother bought my father a used silver plated instrument. And that's the instrument that I found. And um, love is a big word. I mean, I was just seven, but I loved it. It felt it felt good to play. Um, it's, speaking about mentors, I, I was fortunate enough to have um, more than one. If I had to um, outside, if I had to talk about someone, one person outside of my household, because my parents did a lot of um, right things, you know, they invested a lot of a lot of time, energy, and and definitely money that they didn't have to make this happen. But outside of the household, there's a gentleman, Mr. Barry Elmore who was uh, a music teacher, band teacher, choir director in um, Edgar Allan Poe School, uh, a, a public elementary school on the south side of Chicago. And I would say that um, without Barry Elmore's, um, I guess, attention and desire to to motivate and inspire and nurture, not just um, my interest in music, but uh, honestly, a couple of generations of young students on the South side of Chicago. Um, where I am now probably would, would look a little different. It will look a little different. It's just, um, just to have that support, this, just to have someone within the, this public school system that even before I was old enough to play in band was finding opportunities for me to be on stage. That was and that was huge, and I think there's a reason why you know my entire family is still connected to this man because 
my my brother's a professional musician. He he owes his life also to to Barry Elmore, um, and there's there's others, but it really it it does take a village, or not honestly, it could just take a single person. And I I, I I'm grateful for if I had to pick one person in this short period of time, Barry Elmore for for really um, doing what teachers should do, having their eyes open to um, to recognize. Um, it's not just, it's not talent, it's interest. N recognizing the interest that lies, honestly, within uh, within every student, I just happen to find mine early and to have a teacher that recognized that and allowed me to showcase that early on was very beneficial. Very cool. So Will, who was your person? How did you get started? How's it going, everybody? It's good to be here with everyone. Um, brief description of of me. I'm a black male with glasses. My hair is kind of nappy. I love it. Um, um, yeah, I'm wearing a khaki button up shirt. My early early beginning started with uh, just a teacher, right? Like for me, quick story. I wanted to play the saxophone when I was younger, and the reason why I wanted to play is because I was the kid beating on the table while the kids rap. That was what I was doing. And the security guards get really upset at me. He said one day, if you don't stop, I'm gonna send you to detention. And he told me a quick story of how he used to play the saxophone and play gigs on the weekends and make money. So I'm like, I need money. So, <laughs> so I went up to the band teacher. I was really excited and I was just like hyped about playing the sax. And I guess the string teacher was in the same room and they both looked at each other. He just kind of shoved me off. He's like, go sign up. It's all right. Just sign up. I guess the strength teacher, they both kind of looked at each other and said, listen, whoever, let's play golf. Whoever wins this golf game gets this kid in their class. So that's how I got into playing the string instrument. It's not something that I woke up and I wanted to play. It just happened, not necessarily by accident. I didn't know that until 2012, that it was, you know, purposely done. And I, you know, I thank God for that. But, um, but that's kind of how I got into the, the string instrument. And that teacher, his name was James Miles, Mr. Miles is what we call him. And um, he was just a teacher that cared, you know what I mean? Like he was a person that, you know, when I had to take an instrument home, I couldn't afford the 20 bucks a month. He would just give it to me and I would take the instrument home. So I, so I was able to practice at home, you know? And this is like my early years in middle school. I started when I was in eighth grade. so. You know, he was just one of those teachers that really, I don't know if he saw anything in me, I don't know what it was, but he just, he just cared. He wanted, you know, he was just like, listen, I'm going to teach you, you know, I'm gonna show you what it is. And he used to tell me a lot that if this is something that you wanna do for real, you can do it, you know? And uh, I took that to heart and, and, um, and it's something that just really st stuck to me, you know? And, and that's why for me, I think, when I think about just how long I've been playing this instrument, you know, I got to give, I give homage to individuals that just were just present, you know what I'm saying? Because as a kid, there's so many different things going on that can distract you, you know what I mean? And being a, being a kid that grew up in the hood, it's just a lot going on. So music and playing the viola was something that I knew I can go to, you know, that can kind of like focus. I can focus on this thing and nothing else really mattered. But you also to have a teacher that was that that's like, boom! I'm gonna just take you on your wings. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I teach you the things that that is necessary. You know, I'm a, I'll give you the instrument that you need for college. I'll you know he just was one of those teachers that really cared and went above and beyond, Mr. Miles. Well, you're from um, Florida, um, Fort Lauderdale, I think I remember, right? Yep, South Florida. Yep, and. And Damari from Chicago, and I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I have an older sister who started piano lessons, and um, I don't know if I share an interest in it or it was just expected that I would also study piano, but somehow my mom was able to get a piano in the house, um, single parent, four children, um, cleaned other 
uh, wealthy family homes in order to provide a piano and a piano teacher. So it wasn't the schools so much for me as it was this um, African-American matriarch um, also for my family, um, Rachel Richardson, who taught us piano. And Mrs. Richardson had studied piano herself at Yale, one of the first African-American women to actually get a degree in um, organ performance at Yale. And so part of the Hartford community and um, she was the person for my sister and I to learn the fundamentals that actually allowed us to go on into um, college and earn degrees in music. Um, and so it is important, it's critical, quite honestly, to be seen at an early age as having that potential. Um, I do shout outs to music educators because that's what it takes to be able to look at one of us and say, you've got it. But how did you stay, again, motivated? Because there is a lot of things that could pull, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very tall uh, woman. And so it was assumed I would do basketball. And so I was constantly being pulled into trying to do sports as opposed to being a musician. So was that a struggle for you? Or did you have that kind of support to say, no, you're a musician, stay with it? It was uh, at a certain point, um, it felt good to be, you know, to be good at something, you know. Um, and so there was never a moment where somebody was saying, you know, you're, you're a musician, you're going to be a musician. You're going to, I never had that, that pressure. Any, any kind of pressure I had was just, there were just lessons and discipline and commitment, but it was never, it was never, it was never forced. Um, I would say that I had enough moments of obsession and I had enough moments of passion growing up where, for instance, you know, I would start playing a piece of mu music that just blew my mind and I couldn't stop playing it. And then two years will pass by, you know, and then I would have another moment where I just can't, I, I just obsession is the word. I just couldn't, I couldn't stop until, um, until I was in high school and, you know, and then there was a, there was a shift. There was this um, frustration that after a week at, a, at an arts camp, the first week, which I was able to see what I was capable of, of, of doing, you know, I get first chair in this and first chair in that, you know, I was happy about that. And then the second week I lost both of them. That was the turning point. I wasn't happy with that. I, and I, um, that was, a, that showed me how much this meant to me. And honestly, that's when I just started to, um, I started to work and I started to work really, I started to work really hard. It was, um, I would say some people would say, would think that it was extreme, but you know, I had, I had big goals from that point on, but it was inspired by the fact that I accomplished something. And then the next week I lost it because I didn't work. So that was, yeah. If you pair that with just some random moments of inspiration and obsession um, leading up to that point in high school, when I took this, I, I took this seriously from that point. Um, there was no question that this was going to be my, my existence. Yes, because it is those formative years. It's high school years that becomes really difficult to maintain the passion. Was it for you, Will, difficult? Did you try to go in other directions or was it always music and always classical music? Um, in the beginning, it was always classical music. For me, it was it's kind of similar. I think for me, I was never pressured to, to continue to play this, to play this. I think for me, I always had a reason to not stop. You know, like, because I started in eighth grade and I started kind of late, but I guess I loved it enough and I kept going. I always had, like, I was, I was good. People kept saying, telling me I was good. And I would go to competitions in all states and all these different things. I kept getting accolades and it just kept giving me a reason to just keep going. But I think, but I don't think that's the reason why I kept playing. You know what I mean? Um, the reason why I feel like I kept playing is that I can distinctively remember in my orchestra class, there's a 
there is a, a door to the actual orchestra class and there's like a hall like a, a room that's it's like a, a dead space room right and i would go into that little space and i would just take my viola and just play the reason why i would do that because it's, it's a lot of echo in there it's, it's a terrible place to practice but had a lot of reverb in that room so i would just go in there and i would just play whatever i wanted to play i wouldn't play any sheet music i wouldn't play any concerto nothing i would just play whatever i wanted to play i would do the same thing in the bathroom again very very bad places to practice i would do that and i was free you know what i mean when i was doing that i was just completely free and then you know as i got to high school as i got older you know kevin Kev will come by and and he'll bring a, a piece of music that he just learned from from some song on the radio and he would just play and i would play it too and we would just start vibing and you know our high school was very uh you know, our high school was very interesting, man. Like, if you went to we went to a performing arts school, and if you were in that building, you did something. So there's moments where we had jam sessions with kids jamming. You know, someone's on the piano. Sometimes I'll start playing the piano. You know, someone's on the on the upright bass. So it was just it was just always fun, and I just I can't I can't help but to credit that to hip hop and just the culture I grew up in. You know, and because hip hop to me was fearless, you know, it was fearless. And that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to be. So for me, picking up this instrument, regardless of, regardless of the fact that it's been around for hundreds of years, it never, it's never been used in that way. I didn't think about that. I just thought about, boom, this is dope. This is fun. Oh, this beat, let me just play on top of it. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's kind of, I think that's the reason why I kept going. That's, you know, even after going to college, which was very, very different very, very different than being in high school, being around your, your peers and people that honestly look like me, you know what I mean? In college, it was very, very different, you know what I'm saying? And it wasn't as fun, you know? And and to me, as I got older, I started, I started kind of drifting away from just like focusing on the 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 Telemann concerto, all the, you know, the, the big concertos, like, because for me, like, you know, for a long time when I was in high school, I was like, I'm going to be a soloist. I want to be like Yo Yo Ma, you know what I'm saying? And that was me. But as I got to college, it just really became something I was just like, eh, I'm not feeling this no more, you know? So, but I always had hip hop. I always had music that I wanted to play. Was it, wasn't necessarily the traditional thing. It wasn't necessarily classic music. It was just, you know what I'm saying? I will go to a little function. I just pull out my viola and start, you know, start jamming, you know? So I think I credit a lot of that to just hip hop, man, and the culture for keeping me to, to you know, for making me consistent in terms of playing this, this instrument. But you, um, the hip hop, and it was working with Kev that allowed you to be authentic, allowed you to be you. Did you at some point just completely break away from the traditional mode of playing your instrument in an ensemble and then just decide, no, this is me and this is where I'm going to go, regardless yeah. of how people perceive what you're supposed to do with your instrument? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't care what people thought, regardless. It was just a safe space. I was I was safe. I was good. You know, and when I... Because what happened was Kevin and I moved in together and we started producing and, and we wanted to be big major producers. You know, we were very heavily influenced by Timbaland and Neptune's hip hop producers. But we wanted to incorporate classical music in a way that no one's ever done it. You know what I mean? And that was the real motivation. But we didn't think people like the idea of violin on top of hip hop beats, like the way that we do it now. It was just something that was just fun for us to do, you know, until we started performing with other artists and playing on top of their music and people were just really fixated on us and looking at us and that's when we realized oh snap people like this you know and um but it was something it was so it was something that now that i think about it it was just safe safer to do that you know what i mean like what i mean by that is like college was very different Going to college was very, very different. The atmosphere is different. The energy is different. I didn't want to go back to that. You know what I'm saying? And and for me, 
going to this phase of just creating whatever I want to create, man, it was fun. It was safe. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's one of the reasons why. And, and again, hip hop is about doing you, being who you want to be and, and being fearless. So that's that's up my alley. You know what I mean? And I don't want I don't want the restrictions of what classical music is. And and I, you know what? And I still love chamber music. I still love classical music. And I still listen to classical music. You know, Shostakovich, one of my favorite composers. I still listen to it. You know, but um, but this right here is just it's just another level of kind of like the connection that I have with this. It's it's another level. You know what I mean? It's just like I can't I can't let this go. You know what I mean? I I'll play in your quartet. You know what I mean? But it's nothing like me coming here in this space and doing whatever it is I want to do and, and, and showcasing my true self to the world, you know? Um, this It's an interesting notion of being safe. It's an interesting concept. And um, what I love about your, your, your work with Black Violin, um, with Kev, is also, you know, the, when you listen to your music, I remember the moment when uh, I'm I'm just jamming to something. It's it's something that's danceable. And the next piece that's on was your version of Nimrod by Elgar. And it was like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> this where where did that classical piece come into this mix? And I love the synergy of it, actually. But I'm I'm curious, Damari, the word safe. Have you because you went to the Curtis Institute, yes? A, a prestigious conservatory of music. Is that a word you would say? Did you find comfort and safety in how you made music in the conservatory? Um, yeah, that's a very that's a very good question. You know, I, you know, I love listening to what Will had to say and hearing about his path. Um, and although we may, on the surface have um you know different musical existences um my inspiration has been that music too it's the music that i grew up with hip-hop and r and um i never felt the desire to when i was younger to um to to wrap what I was doing with the flute into that. But that music is still, that's the music I listen to. If I'm auditioning for your orchestra, that's the music that I'm listening to, to get me in the right frame of mind before I walk out there and play my 10 minutes. It's, um, and so the, the Curtis, or I also went to Juilliard. Um, did it feel safe? Well, I I was always carrying home home with me, you know. So one of the advantages that I feel that I had, and one advantage that I still have, is that I have the advantage of perspective, in that I'm my best when I can be in an environment that reminds me of of who I am and where I came from. I'm, I'm, I'm my best then. And it's, it's music that brings me there. And it's not actually, it's not classical music that brings me there. And that's, it's staying that connected has been advantageous. Um, it uses the word safe, once again, it fascinates me, but I've used this feeling of being an outsider to my advantage. You know, it's been the reason why, you know, I I make it so that I don't have any days off is because just in case I start to feel unsafe, I can leave. And which is a little bit different than um, most of my colleagues in academ academia and most of my colleagues in orchestras because that's all the, you get an orchestra job and that's what you do. You get a university job and that's what you do. But I am, I'm, I guess I'm coming to the answer to your question. I am fearful of being trapped, fearful. 
I want to be able, and it's, I want to be, be able to, and I have to be able to leave an environment that feels unsafe on my own terms. And I will. I'll leave the orchestra in a heartbeat. I'll leave the university in a heartbeat. If it, if it feels, if it feels unsafe. So um, when I was in school, one of my goals was to create a life where I could do that. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Will is actively working in a safe environment. You know, I work in environments that I assume what could possibly turn unsafe, but I've created a life that I could actually have the power to leave. You have worked, um, Damari, in some incredible, with incredible institutions, um, the Metropolitan, I think it was the Metropolitan Opera I remember seeing. I mean, you are currently chair, principal of the um, flutist of the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. These are established protocols and environment. Um, and I understand that the word safe, especially with African Americans, is um, a difficult word. And that's why when Will used it, it's like, wow, that's good. <laughs> but I don't get to hear that very often. Um, what Damari does working for these orchestras provide you? How does that, what part of your authentic self does it provide you? Well, <laughs> It's interesting um, when the when it just comes down to to to, to playing. It's you know it, 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 at times and a lot of oftentimes it's the same reaction I had when I was a kid. You know these moments of obsession, just being you know this music this is this is beautiful for instance right. Um, that said. That said, I would say that it, it, at times outside of that, it can be frustrating. It, it is frustrating. And in a way it's lonely, you know, but I, um, there is a good network of, of, of black classical musicians out there that are just a text away and we communicate. Um, and it's actually kind of interesting, not funny. It's interesting to me over the past couple of years or so, the things that um, uh, have inspired um, certain certain words from people in organization because a black man was killed by the police. I found a lot of things very interesting that have happened over the past couple of years. Um, and I'll say when it comes to these um, major organizations that I work for, and I and, and I have to say, I'm separating this from the work that I do for the organizations. For instance, I love teaching, love it. Not everyone does. I love it, and it's a very important part of my existence. I love playing in ensembles. Like, boy, I do. I love it. Love, and um, enjoy for the most part. My colleagues love that feeling. Um, but that said. Um, I think I don't, my problem would have to be, generally speaking, with the people. It's, it's with the people. And I, in a way, I kind of don't blame them. It makes sense that I'm, I feel that I'm the one person that really cares about things like, um, why am I the only one? You know, and I don't, I don't really blame, I don't blame the music really. The, the music, I mean, it's like we bring it to life. It's the people. The people don't want it. They really deep down, because why would they? It doesn't, it doesn't really affect them. But if it affects me, if I see another person, if I'm sitting next to a person, Aspen last summer, first time in my life, I've been doing this for a long time, first time in my life. Principal flutist, I, I sat next to a black principal oboist. That doesn't make any sense because there's a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of great, great black musicians out there. And it felt amazing. 
And so from that experience, I'm like, okay, well, this needs to happen more. Anyway, I can go on and on, but it's, um, it's, there's a real, a real lack of desire to change because, you know, it, it, it took a black man being killed for them to want the change. And nothing changed for me. I couldn't agree more. I am the, I believe, um, I teach at a small Christian university here in Seattle. And I do believe I am the only tenured black faculty woman on campus. So the, being the only one, it is um, great faculty, love the community and people care, but not enough because if people really cared, it would look different. So, well, you started something with the safe piece of you get to do your work and that's amazing. Um, what are the challenges in terms of what you do? Um, I mean, the challenge is really is just being away from home. <laughs> I think that's one of the main challenges. Sometimes um, like this, this year, when I leave Sunday, I mean, I'm, I'll be out for three, three and a half weeks, you know, I have three little kids. So that's tough. That's, so that's the toughest thing. But I know what I'm doing is, is, is great work. Besides the fact that I love what I'm doing, when I'm on stage, I know there's somebody somewhere in that audience that would have looked at me and thought all these different things. But when they see me on stage and playing this viola, their minds have changed a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I know what I'm doing is great work. So that keeps me, that also keeps me motivated. So, um, but it is tough to, to be, to play this instrument and go to certain cities. One of the main things for me, as I, cause we tour this whole country, you know what I'm saying? Like little towns, one of the toughest things for me uh, for the last, I would say five years was just going into a community and not seeing us represent in this community. And it's because the theaters that we perform at, these venues that we perform at don't necessarily reach out to the communities or don't even know how to. And even if, even if they do, they're not doing it in a way that is, um, they just don't know how to do it. Because historically, particularly these venues, you know, black folks just weren't allowed to be at these venues. So there's a history there. So that's one of the things I've been talking to my manager about a lot of these people about because we got to figure out how to really connect with these communities because what, what we do on stage, as much as what I do on stage is not difficult, at least for me, it's not hard for me, but I know and I see the, the, the level of power that I have when I'm on this stage, particularly with little kids, you know what I'm saying? So I want, I want little kids that look like me to, to feel that, to feel that man, they can, they can, they see that and they see me and they just think they're inspired. They can do anything. And I want everybody to feel that no matter what color you are, but specifically these communities I go to, I can tell that there's not enough reach. There's not enough, you know, so that's been a lot of the difficulty for me for the last five, six years. And I see, and I, it's, it's, we've been talking to a lot of marketing teams and we found a really, really good marketing team that's actually really, really helping with that. And it's, and it's making me, and it's making me smile. It's really great to see me, uh, we go into these different communities and it's like, we're well represented. It's because there is a certain level of engagement with these communities, you know what I'm saying? And the representation is everything, man, when it comes to this this world that we're in, you know what I mean? Like, it's everything. Like, you know, I didn't have a black violin growing up, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have something like this that would make, that I could see and be like, oh, okay, yeah, you know what I mean? And and I and I thank God that I was able to continue and pursue this, this music and, and playing this instrument despite not having that, but I know how powerful that is. And I know how necessary that is. That's why, you know, that's one of the things that we try to make sure that we make sure that we're, you know, we're voicing that in every, every city that we go, you know? So, so that's, that's the difficulty, you know, and for us, we try not to really harp on anything, man. Like for me, 
when I travel, when I'm on stage, listen, man, Will is going to perform. Will is going to do what Will wants to do. I'm not thinking about what the audience is thinking. I don't care about what the audience is thinking. I'm being me. And that's just, that is so important. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm doing me. I'm being who I am. I am happy. I'm joyful. This ain't that fake joy. This is like the real joy. And if you come on on this journey, then come on. Let's let's for this hour and a half. Let's let's do this. You know what I'm saying? I'll take you on a journey. You know what I mean? And and um and I think because of the way that I approach the music, it kind of lingers off into the audience, and the audience can kind of like see it. And and um and we hopefully that particularly these communities that we go to, they can see someone like me, man, and just have a different outlook on someone that looks like me. Man. That's one of the biggest props, I think, in, in terms of what I do, you know? Well, without question, you both, just by showing up, make a difference, just by showing up. And so when I looked at um, and read more about Black Violin and how extraordinary you, the two of you have been with your work, the, the decision to promote positivity and hope through your work, your messaging, your videos, all of your music. It is about life and light and joyfulness, even through difficult times. Um, and I just want to do a shout out that you have made a commitment to working with youth. Can you speak about that? Like, why? What is, how do you spend your time working with the youth? Well, we, we perform for about like 150,000 kids a year because a typical day would be we would, the, the crew loads in around 6 a.m. and we do like a 10.30, 11 a.m. show and they bust in, you know, they fill the theater with kids, you know, high energy kids just having a good time. And and that's that's kind of what we do, perform for them and we talk to them a little bit just about, you know, what we do and, and, um, and hopefully they're inspired and, and, you know, and they go back to school just amped up and want to just take on the world and we also have a foundation black violent foundation and what we do is the the it's basically the extension of what we already do but also in our careers man along with mr miles and other people that helped us really fill in the gaps you know there's moments where we needed certain things whether it was an instrument whether it's a flight to a music camp we had people that were there to to help us and provide us with these things that we needed, you know? And um, and as a young musician, man, any little thing could, could really snuff out your dream. Like it could just make you just feel like you don't wanna do it anymore. And luckily we, we always had somebody that was there and we wanna be able to provide that for kids, man, that we feel like have the drive, have the passion, but just are missing one little piece, you know what I mean? And we wanna be able to provide that, that, that piece that they need to really take take them to that next level and and again the reason why for us we started focusing more on this is because you know i think about spider-man's quote with, with great power comes great responsibility or whatever and and that's kind of what that's kind of why we do it because we see it we see the level of power we have you know we can't just take this and just throw it away or fly with it we got to use this you know like kids are really moved by our performance you know what i'm saying and you know for me it's 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 hard to look look at it from their perspective right and i see it so let's do more of that let's you know what i'm saying and it's as much as we're giving that performance to them we're giving something to them i mean they're doing amazing things for my spirit you know what i'm saying when i see their faces light up when i see just how um I don't know, it's hard to describe, man. It's hard to describe a, a child just sitting there and they're just kind of like into themselves. And by the end of the show, they're completely opened up. You know what I mean? It's an amazing thing to see. So that's why that's that's the, one of the best things we do. That's why, you know, I we're never going to stop doing that because it's it's great. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's amazing to be able to, to really uh, have that effect on people, you know? That's fabulous. And Damari, just by, like I just said, just by you sitting in that chair, you changed, you changed the orchestra. What does it mean for you to pay it forward? You say you love to teach. I get it. So do I. What does it mean for you to pay it forward? Hmm. Let me just add, just hearing you say that, just by me being in that chair, 
imagine if there were 10 of me. Oh, well, okay. I'm trying. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. Seriously. I, yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I know, I hear, I, 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 I know that I've inspired people throughout my, my career. I, I know that. I want, I, I want more of that. I mean, I can, and I can do that as an individual, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm aware of that. But imagine if there were 10, that's not too much to ask. I mean, I say that really tongue in cheek because please, you know, 10 would be 10%, you know, and, um, but it's really, it's, it's important that, that, um, that children, that young black children are, are, are really are taken seriously. I think, you know, once again, I started off my portion of the conversation talk of, talking about Mr. Barry Elmore. And it was that I, I, I know there's countless kids because I'm, I'm still in contact with a lot of them. I know so many black kids who went, they went through Edgar Allan Poe School in Chicago that were inspired, um, whether they went into music or not. And I think it's that. I think that we were taken seriously. That's all. It doesn't require a lot. Yeah. It doesn't require a lot. So, yes, I will play for, I will talk to as many kids as I can. Um, since I'm part of these big, big, in, in classical music terms, organizations, um, they just need to do a. They need to do a lot more. They need to do a lot more, you know. Because um, I just, I, 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 I care about my. I care about my community, and I want my community taken seriously, you know. And these organizations are doing it for the grant money, you know. And it's really, it's, it's, it's a missed opportunity to to make. A, a big difference. It actually doesn't require a, a lot of money, and it's on every every level. I can give you a, a quick example. Okay. Quick example, because orchestras just like they like not just orchestras, but a lot of organizations like when you talk about this and you talk about diversity, they're like, but but what about our the excellence that we have to maintain, right? So, okay. Let's just say, for instance, that there was an opening in the flute section, for instance, hypothetically speaking. There was an opening, and this opening is going to happen like in a year. I can easily come up with a list of, of 25 Black flutists, easily, that are really good, that have never been invited, you know? We'll talked about some of the theaters that they play in, you know. Those doors were closed. You know, eventually you stop showing up to the parties you're not invited to. You know, you can open the door if you like to, but how are we supposed to know the door is open? We stop coming. You have to go out there. So let's just say there's an opening. And prior to the audition, contractually, let's say I could invite 25 black flutists to sub. They each get a week with the orchestra. Doesn't require any shifts in contracts or anything. Invite them. That's what I would do. You know, you have 25 black flutists that are actually literally invited to perform with the major symphony orchestra, right? Come time for the audition, chances are very good that a good portion of those 25 flutists will show up to the audition. Let's say 20 flutish, black flutists showed up. That would be more than any professional audition in the history of orchestra auditions. That small number. It's that, it's that easy. So let there be a, an opening in the Seattle Symphony and let me have the opportunity to show this organization how easy it is. Then you have it all the audition behind the screen. You let the process take place. You know, you let the process happen. 
but you do this every every audition it within five years it will look different it will actually be and you say it with pride an orchestra that really looks like the country which if i were head of these organizations i would i would be doing everything in my power to do just even if i was just about the money as head of an organization that's amazing marketing to be the first orchestra that looks like this country you know in all of his beautiful diversity but people are just too short-sighted you know mm, a little more than that but uh huh um well i there's a lot i could say to tamari but i'm going to ask you how would you comment on that from your perspective um <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I think we are, are we we all three of us are very very familiar with just the just the process in general, and I think, you know, I can't help but to go. Sometimes we got to go back in order to go forward, you know. And I think, for instance, I, you know, I'll give you an example. Like <clears throat> we've done, we used to play with orchestras a lot. You know what I mean? Like we would basically we did two shows in, in DC with. Uh, um, my mind's like shooting blanks now. <laughs> Was it the national? So we play a lot with, yeah. National you know, it's a big show, right? One of the biggest orchestras in this country. You know, we did two shows, two sold out shows, and it was very different from what we normally do. You know what I mean? And we have to kind of, we had to tame ourselves a little bit because when we do our regular show, the subs are rattling. You know, so it it it's an it's a it's a rock concert. It's huge. It's big, and so this time we had to we had to tame it a little bit because it's an orchestra and on all these different things, and just the the attitude and just just the the energy from the orchestra was just like it was it was, and we've done maybe like twenty five or thirty of those, right? And and but we haven't done them in, in like maybe we haven't done it the last three four years because. Me personally, I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. And the reason why is because it's just not a cool experience. Like they didn't, they didn't care to try to understand or I don't care if you feel, you don't have to feel my music, but you respect what it is that I'm doing. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like you can put that piece of paper in front of me. I can play what you play, you know? But just that level of just not caring, not trying to understand, it's just the reason why there's just this this disconnect. You know what I'm saying? And for a lot of for a lot of a lot of us, like a lot of black folks, we you know, you've shut that door. You we've tried to come in, you've shut that door. So now we're just like, well, you know, cool. We don't need that anymore. We got Curtis Mayfield. We got we got dope stuff too. You know what I'm saying? So. That's kind of where I'm at with it, and it's like, and I and I and and I hear you speak, and I'm just and I understand it so well, you know what I'm saying? And it's something that we we all get it right, and and we know the reason why, but it still doesn't make it easy, you know. What I'm saying we we get it, we know the reason why, you know. And I speak about this all the time, where class and music is just not it's not an inviting, it's just not inviting as much as. I love, you know what I'm saying? I, I remember just, we did the show years back where we played like half classical and the rest half was like hip hop. And, you know, we, we flew in like a cellist and another violin and we played this really chamber. It was really, really, really dope. And um, and I and I love doing that, but it's just like, there's certain spaces you go to and just the idea of just like, this thing belongs to these people and these people and it's just like, it's unfortunate. It is what it is, you know what I mean? And um and it's something that especially in my early years that I've gone through a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like especially in my early years, you know, I've been I've been denied playing at this orchestra because of the way my hair looked, you know what I'm saying? I know I was let go because of what, the way my hair was looking, you know what I'm saying? Cuz I used to have a little fro, you know what I mean? And I know it was because of that reason and you know you chuck it off. You chuck it off, and just you just move on. You just you know you move. And but I still I'm still fortunate that I am able to be here and able to do what I do because of all the individuals before me that paved the way. You know what I'm saying? 
I think it's somebody like Stuff Smith who, you know, actually has a had a performance degree in, in classical, you know, violin, you know, in the forties. Like that's that's inspiring. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's that's amazing, you know, and these individuals paved the way for me to be here, for every one of us to be here. And granted, there's a lot to be done. Like you mentioned there, I mean, it's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I commend the individuals that are trying to make sure that this space is ours as well. I commend those individuals that are going to make people understand, look, man, we, we here. You know what I'm saying? Respect us and respect that we're here. We ain't going nowhere. I I respect those individuals. I'm just not one of those. I'm just not gonna do that. I'm just not, I'm the one that's not going to do that. You know what I mean? And I will assist and I will do whatever I can if a child wants lesson, if I see a child with potential and that per, and that child wants to become the greatest violist in the world, man, I will give this child everything to do that. If they want to be the first area and the, the biggest orchestra in, in this country, man, I would give them anything to make sure they do that. But it has to be something that they want to do, not because of trying to fit into the, some mold. You know what I'm saying? Because we are amazing as we are, no matter what it is that you do. If you play violin, flute, cello, guitar, and you decide to do it however you want to do it, if you try to do it in a traditional way, you are amazing regardless of how you do it. You know what I'm saying? And that's, <laughs> I'm rambling right now, but that's, that's pretty much what, what I got to say. And I definitely understand um, what you, what, what you said earlier, man. And it is what it is, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Well, there's a lot there. It, that's truth telling. And um, watching the time, we only have a minute or so left. Um, we get to own classical music. It gets to be part of our heritage too. I love it. I've grown up on it. Um, it's not okay to have one in an environment and feel like the box has been checked. Personally, I think it's when we are in those management positions, the Mari, that we get to change the structure. It requires us to start to own more of those positions in order to change the playing field, because it's not a fair one yet, still. Um, I've had beautiful experiences of people seeing me. I, I was able to spend many summers um, with the Boston Symphony at Tanglewood through college, through university training. And like you, Damari, um, it only requires a text. I know phenomenal musicians, educators, African-American who are, are trying to um, be seen. And it's the invisibility part or the one is enough part that is difficult. But I just honor the work that you both do, what you represent to so many. I, again, just watching what Black Violin has meant to a couple of decades now, the, even just the longevity of your work, Will, is astounding. Um, and Damari, you're midway in your career, who knows how far you will go, but just being the chair of a major symphony orchestra is a proud moment for all of us. So I don't know whether, you know, the challenge, whether it's at the elementary level in terms of being seen, how do we spot that child that says, oh no, you have talent. I'm gonna see what it takes to get you that flute or that violin or those piano lessons. All the way up through a career, there are people who see us who will continue to open the door. And then, yeah, Will, you represent that less than 1% that says, no, I'm not saying I need that. I'm, we're just gonna do it our own way. That is the key, that level of permission to do so. And so just speaking into that, do you see the trajectory, Will, of where Black Violin is going? How many more years? What's the um, I mean, um, for me, me personally, I don't, I don't ever see myself stopping. I man, this is, again, this is bigger than me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think if it was up to, 
if this is solely because of you know you know giving will this thing that's gonna make sustain will and I, and I think I would slow down a little bit a long time ago but it's just it's just so much bigger than me you know what I mean and I, again the level of power and influence that we have it's hard to ignore you know what I mean so for me I, I don't see myself ever stopping it may not be as performing as much but I see myself doing a lot of these talks is like doing the doing the pandemic we did a whole a lot of these conversations and and um you know and I think especially with the kids, man, I don't think it ever, it ever stops. And uh, with the foundation that we're doing now, I just, just got to keep going. Cause I think it's necessary, man. I think it's necessary to just, it's all about the kids, man. When, when, when kids are, when kids are exposed to things, when kids are able to dream or kids are able to just have a passion that they can honestly focus on. I mean, it just, it changes the world. And I think, you know, there, there are so many shortcomings when it comes to certain you know, our folks, and it's just, you know, I want to be able to do what I can. I feel like I was put on this planet to, to, I think we're all, we're all put, everybody, we're put in, we're put in this world to obtain something, to get something. And once we get it, once we know how to do it really well, whether it's education or whether, whether it's money, I think our goal and what we, and, and the way that we unlock our true joy is that we take that thing and give it away. You know what I'm saying? And <clears throat> I think I'm in the giving away process, I guess. You know what I mean? And I think that's why it's it fulfills me so much. You know, I'm, I'm in this, I'm going to give it away. Whatever it is that I have up here, whatever it is that I have up here, I want to give it to people that I feel like um, I need it. You know what I mean? So I don't think, I don't see myself ever stopping. Um, I'm going to invite Aaron from SCG to come back into our space. But until then, Damari, I, I want to give you the last words of this. What are your thoughts? Last words. There, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, you know, if I'm going to be an optimist, which I actually am. And I just can't wait for the audience's to, to hear the excellence that, that comes from, from proper, uh, 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 proper recognizing of the talent that's within, within my community. I look forward to the organizations really um, being in a position where you can see and you can experience the excellence that comes from um, recognizing and showcase the talent within my my community and um yeah i'm there's a lot to look forward to wow well on behalf of stg we really would like to thank all three of you uh dr brown for moderating damari and will it's been an honor to have you uh with all of us today sharing your truth your passion uh, your experience and allowing us to really understand the complexity of how and what you navigate uh, as classical musicians. And so uh, representation matters and the three of you matter. Um, you have such a huge impact on people across the world. And so we thank you for joining STG's The People's Theater Talks. We appreciate your thoughts and experience. To everyone watching, we hope you all will attend Black Violin on March 4th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you all and take care. <laughs>